Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode. I'm Mike Monticello. I'm Emily Thomas. And I'm Steve Ellick. So today we're going to be focused on the redesigned 2024 Chevrolet Traverse. Uh, these are going to be our first impressions, and these impressions are based on a model that we bought for, uh, anonymously from a local dealer, uh, as we do with every vehicle that goes through our test program. So this one will be going through our test program. For those that don't know what the Traverse is, it's a three-row mid-sized SUV slots between the Equinox and the larger Tahoe and Chevy's SUV lineup. And just for background on the Traverse, it was a solid competitor. You know, one of those SUVs that's great at doing really good things, but you know, it's not, a, it's not like a wonderful vehicle to drive, but it's just a really good all around family SUV. Um, nothing stood out about it being bad. Nothing stood out about it. Like it wasn't like an amazing handler or anything like that, but just a really good SUV. And as such, it ranked typically, uh, you know, toward the upper reaches of the, of the category in our ratings for 2024. It gets new exterior styling, a new infotainment screen, but the biggest change is under the hood. So the V6 is gone. You can't get that anymore. The only engine is a turbocharged four cylinder. Um, and we're gonna have a lot to say about that through our discussion. So we bought a 2024 Chevrolet Traverse LT all wheel drive. The LT is the second, second tier trim. Uh, so it has a 328 horsepower, 2.5 liter turbocharged four cylinder. Eight speed automatic transmission. We got the optional all wheel drive. It comes standard with front wheel drive. And along with a few options, including the enhanced driving package, which brings GM Super Cruise uh, hands free active driving assistance system, plus the $1,395 destination fee that uh, Chevy tra charges on all traverses. Total cost of our test vehicle is $49,460. Um, so, three row mid size SUV family vehicle. I can't think of two people more qualified to talk about a vehicle like this uh, that are here at ATC at the Auto Test Center because you both have uh, young families and I would think this would be a vehicle that would be certainly your tar this, you're, the, you're the target audience, I think, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Yeah. But even though it would make sense to talk about second and third row room, maybe cargo space, maybe how the child seats fit, we're going to start with the engine because I think it could be a deal breaker for some people. And I'm gonna start with a quote from Alex Nizek, who was one of our uh, engineers here at uh, the Auto Test Center. And this is what he had to say about the new turbocharged four cylinder. He said, the engine is so loud, especially anything above 2,500 to 3,000 RPM, it presents as a tiny engine screaming and reverberating inside of a giant echo chamber. The vehicle is generally quiet otherwise, and thankfully the engine settles into the background when cruising. So that's not exactly high praise, I would say. <laughs> um, Maybe he missed his calling as a and writer. <laughs> if you look at the logbook comments, uh, we keep log, you know, digital logbook on all of our test vehicles. There's a lot of people kind of, in a sense, echo, not to use a pun, but uh, what Alex said, but not everyone. And I want to start with you, Steve. Uh, what did you think about this new engine? And yeah, I just like kind of, especially thinking about how good the previous V6 was. Yeah, I um, I think it replaces the V6 quite well, actually. It really? It has pretty good power. It has no turbo lag, which you may expect from having a four-cylinder turbo. The transmission shifts nice and smoothly, and, I mean, it has this linear power delivery. I think the engine itself and the transmission it's mated to is, is pretty good. It's executed pretty well, other than, you know, the sound that a lot of people mentioned. I also took something out of the digital logbook. Mike Quincy said it sounds like a metal box filled with rocks. So, <laughs> And that's not good, right? It's not great, but I didn't think it was as bad as some other four-cylinder turbo larger SUVs out there. Um, yeah, this is kind of common that they're, they're this loud when they have such a small engine and such a large vehicle. Yeah. yeah, for me, it really didn't bother me as much. I was kind of surprised when I went into the logbook and I saw just how passionately people felt me about too. the noise. Yeah, <laughs> we're, we're a passionate group here. You are a passionate group. Um, I guess we are a passionate group. But I like hearing that feedback, I went and drove it again and realized that, okay, yes, like when you're, it's accelerating, it's a little noisy. I'll give it that. But once you kind of get into your trip, it dies down and it's fairly comfortable. Like it, it didn't stand out to me throughout like the course of my drive. And I had taken it home. So I'm driving down the highway, right? Like um, Joe and I did a little field trip together. So we were doing like all the back roads, <laughs> you know, down to the shoreline and stuff. And it was fairly comfortable. It was, it was 
easy enough to um, handle. It it drove smoothly. The noise wasn't a huge factor for me. So I, I was kind of surprised when I finally went to go put my notes in. And I was like, oh, people have a lot to say about the noise. Yeah, I mean, they really have. And I think one of the things, because it is kind of noisy, it's kind of gravelly, it's just not a pleasant sound. Like you can make a Turbo 4 that sounds pleasant, right? This one is not one of those. And I think that actually led some people to think, man, this thing's really underpowered, but it actually has more power than, than you know, the V6 did before. It just it's sounds just, like it's working really it hard. Sounds, exactly. It sounds like it's working really hard. It's not, I, you know, uh, I think Steve's right. I think it actually works well. It operates well in terms of, you know, the reasonably smooth shifts and that it does have the power there when you need it. It's there, but it's just going to make a fair amount of racket to get it. Um, so It wants you to know that it's present. Yeah. I mean... I, I found it kind of gravelly and kind of obnoxious. I, I don't like it. I don't like this engine, but uh, that's just me. But how often are you also, like, in a given trip, how often are you having to really, like, push the, right. so once you're, push well, the engine you, like that? I mean, you don't have to flirt, though, it's because, so it doesn't have, uh, I mean, basically any time, during normal acceleration, you're probably going to get over 3,000 RPM. And, and once you get reach 3000 RPM, that's around the time that it starts to get really noisy and noticeable. So around town, if you're, you know, half throttle or more, you're definitely going to notice it. Mm -hmm. All those situations. Once you're on the highway, yeah. Or, or you're cruising on a regular two lane road. And you're, like you said, you're up to speed. I think it's fine. It's not like, it's not like it's a, it's a terrible engine. It's just not a good sounding engine. Do you know what I mean? So, so that's, but you know, I we, think the Atlas was louder and had a worse sound personally, but you know, yeah, it, it's, this is own. the new trend. To have the four the turbo fours are the new trend, yeah. and it's in. And some people do them better than others. It's it's mm -hmm. a little bit of a bummer in some ways, but you know you can understand why they would want to do it. Typically, it's for fuel economy. But uh, although that we have seen that that doesn't always work out either. You well, know? I think this is another case of um, we see this in the car seat world, right? Which is a good chunk of my world, where just because you have a feature, right? just because you have this turbo four cylinder, right? Doesn't necessarily make it automatically good. Right. How it's implemented, how it's tuned really matters and can vary greatly, right? Between manufacturers and sometimes even within a manufacturer. So it is important to really like when you, if you're considering the new Traverse, take it for a solid test drive, like really try it out in the different scenarios that are most common to your typical like driving and see how that feels for you and take into account these different things right like for me personally like i do a ton of highway driving so this might not bother me as right, much right but if that's not your norm and you are as you're saying having to like accelerate frequently it would probably get obnoxious before it's really gonna bother you during your day-to-day -day driving and and i think the maybe you know obviously it's re a really good idea to take a test drive this is a vehicle you really need to take a test drive. You, you need to make sure you're okay with that engine sound. If you're okay yeah. with it, it operates fine. It operates really well, but you got to make sure you're okay with that note. Just as an example, my girlfriend was like, you know, why is this thing so loud? You know, and she was talking about the engine, you know, so um, yeah. anyway, but enough about the engine. Let's talk about how did it, you were, you were starting to talk about that you liked the way it drove in terms of the ride and the handling. Do you think it has a pretty nice mix, something that you'd be comfortable with? Yeah. So you know, when we first started talking about the car, I didn't have a lot to say because I felt like it was just kind of middle of the road. You know, there was nothing terribly exciting about it, but there was nothing that stood out to me. as like, oh my gosh, this is god awful. And I never want to be in this vehicle again, right, right. which just happened. Right. <laughs> right. For sure. So um, I think it was a nice mix for me to be able to kind of take it on the highway for my usual commute and then also do a lot more of like our windy country roads back here. Um and in that, like, I thought it handled fine. And, you know, I wasn't, like, feeling a ton of body roll where I yep. felt like um, I didn't have control of the vehicle, which is good because it's a large vehicle, right? It like, is. Like, the yeah. Traverse is, it's big. Yeah. And so um, with those bigger vehicles, sometimes I can feel like, okay, this is a little unwieldy and I don't feel like I'm always in control of what the car is doing. Yeah. Um, so I appreciate that it, it handled well. I appreciate that, like all those bends and turns, country roads, you have a decent amount of potholes and yep. various 
ruts and bumps. And, you know, for the most part, they didn't come through super strong. Um, there was a few that were a little bit more like pronounced. I was like, whoa, I really felt that one. But for the most part, like it was just averagely enjoyable. Like no, nothing was making me be like, I need to get out of this. Right yeah, now. I agree. The suspension <laughs> is tuned pretty well. I mean, it's on the firmer side, I yes. think. You could, yeah. you could feel some bumps come through. It absorbs some bumps well, others you can feel. But like it's definitely tuned for that um, more toward the handling side, which is a I find to be a pretty good thing for such a large vehicle. As you were saying, a lot of the time you feel body roll and, and this it, it, it's more confidence inspiring than some of its peers of this size. Um, and it, yeah. like to your point, it's, it's really like the car as a whole is like a jack of all trades, but a master of none. Like that's what I wrote in the logbook because it really does a lot of things very well, but not like amazingly well not but it's not, not right. exceptional but it's not no. a deal breaker in any any way either well I, one I, kind of deal breaker i'll get to that later i, I think you both did capture it really well though in terms of the ride and handling first of all it's a nice balance between the two right like it actually does pretty well for as you said how big of a vehicle it is and yet most of the hits are controlled pretty well like you said some come through but it's you know overall it's it's pretty darn good in terms of that that balance between the two i'm going to be curious to see when it goes through our full program, how it does in like our handling course, the emergency handling, especially, right? Because when you have a vehicle that size from like the safety perspective, the concern would be that like, sure, you're in this big tank kind of vehicle, right? It'll protect you in a crash um, because you just have physics in your favor. <laughs> you're larger, you're, bi right, you're right. bigger than everybody else. But if you need to avoid a crash, a vehicle that size might be difficult, yeah, right? That's where sure. that's where it might not shine. Right. And so in our braking testing, in our emergency handling testing, like how is this vehicle going to perform? And is it going to be able to do justice so that like you do feel like you can safely avoid a crash in those emergency kind of situations right. without losing control of the vehicle? So I'm curious how that's going to play out. Um, but in the day-to-day, -day, I think it was, I think it was fine. Yeah. And uh, so... Uh, and we're going to find all that out. Let's move into the interior and let's start talking about the things that, you know, people are, you know, families are going to care about second and third seat room. Steve, let's start with you. Uh, what did you think about the second row in terms of comfort space, those kinds of things now? So I have a forward facing seat and a rear facing seat. Um, and they fit in the captain's chairs perfectly. You can slide the captain's chairs forward or back to make any combination of room. If you have someone in the third row, then you can make more leg room for them. Um, the coolest feature in this car is having that forward facing child seat installed in the second row captain's chair, and then being able to pull that entire captain's chair with the seat installed forward so that you could access the third row. I love that feature. The Atlas also has it. And um, it's if you're using that third row often, it's kind of hard to live without that. Yeah. 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 So I saw that note and it's not a new feature. A lot of yeah. vehicles in this class um, and larger and like minivans, right, have that kind of, you know, um, tilt and, and fold sort of feature. Mm -hmm. And the claim always is like, oh, you can do this with a child seat installed. And that is true in a very specific circumstance. And that circumstance is what you have oh. in your car, because <laughs> I know how you have your child yep. seats installed. And that's if you have a forward facing child seat that's installed with the lower anchors. So when it's installed with the lower anchors, right, you don't have that seatbelt interference, especially in the traverse, in our traverse, um, the seatbelts for the second row captain's chairs are uh, mounted on the seat pillar. And so if you had a seatbelt installation for your, for your child seat, especially if if you're doing a child seat installed correctly, that seatbelt is locked. So now you are not able to do that tilt and fold with the car seat still there. So you really kind of have to have it in this sweet spot of having your lower anchors uh, installation and a forward facing seat in order to really make use of that feature or have like a booster seat in that position. Um, but to that point though, when you have that sweet spot, it is a great way to get in there. Well, that's yeah, where right? Steve lives. Well, he lives in the sweet spot. I do. But also another good thing about this is being able to slide that captain's chair back. So I can I can go in front of the car seat too and, and go in between the two right. captain's chairs to access the third row as well. It's not as roomy as sliding it forward. Yeah, but right. like it has a good, yeah, many combinations. <sighs> right. that Now, I love your kids. Yeah. I really do. <laughs> but 
What about adults? Did you guys sit in the second row uh, without the car seats? And what did, did you think of the second row? Honestly, I thought the second row captain's chairs were pretty comfortable. Um, you know, they have just enough contouring for me that like, I didn't feel like I was sliding around on the seat. Um, it provided me some some support laterally. And I found that the um, like the cushion length was good yep. for, for my size, right? I, Obviously, I am not the tallest of our bunch, and so others might feel differently than me. But for me, <laughs> it was pretty good. Um, I did pop into the third row to see yep. how that is. Yep. And there is where it gets like a little bit more uncomfortable, right? You have your your hips and your knees kind of at a an otter angle right. that you know might not be so comfortable for long durations. And the the seat cushion is shorter, so it kind of hit me in the back of my thighs where I was like, okay, you know, I would have to like really kind of flex my legs or stretch out more often just to kind of alleviate that pressure point. Yep. Um, but as with many three row vehicles, that third row is not really geared for no. full size adults. <laughs> it's not. And it's, it's one of the better ones actually though, in terms of, um, that the cushion is a little bit higher off the ground. So you don't have as uncomfortable of that, you know, with your knees way up in the mm -hmm. air, they still yeah. are bent in a slightly uncomfortable way, but it's not as bad. And the space isn't too bad, so I mean, I think it's it's decent. Like yeah. a lot of SUVs in this category has a you know hard plastic outer armrest, which is kind of a a, a bummer. Uh, but it's it's as far as these size vehicles, it's actually one of the better ones. Like you said, though, still most adults aren't going to be back there for very long. You know, comfort yeah. wise. If you're going to yeah. be transporting adults, get the Tahoe. Yeah, I, I think it's it's yeah. fine for kids in this third row, but yeah, yeah, uh, it, there are bigger options if you're going to be. Or put your forward-facing kids right. in that third row and let That's your adults yeah. sit in the in the captain's chairs that have a little bit more comfort to them. It is easy enough to access that third row to strap them in. So well, yeah. that's a good point. Now, which way are you talking about access in the third row? Because you can do it one of two ways. When you have captain's chairs, you can just go in between. You know, there's enough mm -hmm. space to go in between, yeah. which is what I actually prefer to do. You have to duck a fair amount to get back in there, but at least you don't have to move the seat. And the seat isn't quite as easy as some. I mean, it's reasonably easy. But you're using a lever on top of the seat back. It's not like some of the competitors. You can just press, press a button. button. Yeah. yeah. It just automatically slides and tilts forward mm -hmm. on its own. Here yeah. you have to do the you lever. Have to you do gotta, the, you have you to know, do the work. Force it a little bit yourself. Yeah. Not a big deal. Still works fine. Yep. But it's just yeah. not quite as easy. So I think I think I might just jump back through between the two seats, which obviously you wouldn't be able to do if you had a bench. But right. our, our version has the, ca the captain's chair. So. Yeah. so not terrible. Right. The other thing that I like about the third row here which this past summer, my father-in-law stayed with us. Um, he was visiting from India. And so I got relegated to the third row a lot um, whenever we were in group traveling. And so I've come to notice a lot where the vents are in the third row. And um, part of what makes sitting in the third row so hard can be just like how stuffy it yeah, gets, yeah, which is like sure. sort of, I'm not a person who usually gets car sick, but when I'm in the third row and there's like zero ventilation or the vents are kind of like right where you sit. So your own body is covering them. Yep. It makes it awful. And I really appreciated that the vents were on the ceiling. And so I was like, okay, you could turn them still. Like they also just weren't like fixed, right? You would be able to turn them towards you and, and adjust the airflow and basically just have better airflow back right. there. So that would also contribute to me. That's a big part of third row comfort is right. whether or not I will... Mm -hmm feel like I'm going to pass out. Right. <clears throat> now, um, let's talk about the driver's seat. I didn't find it that great. Um, curious what you guys thought. Um, I find that there's like too much built-in lumbar support, which I'm not a person. Yes. Is that sounds like we're agreeing here. <laughs> yeah. I don't usually use much lumbar support anyway, but I, every time I got in, I'm trying to turn. I'm like, why? Who turned it up? And I'm like, well, I was the last one in there. Why did I? Why would I have turned it up on myself? So I'm always trying to do that. And, you know, uh, Lateral support's okay, it's not great, but it's just, it's not like a really comfortable seat. And the front passenger seat is all manual controls. And this is, you know, a, a $50,000 vehicle. And it seems like you should have some power controls there. But Steve, yes. you're kind of on board with me on the driver's seat, it's just not that great. 100% agree yeah. with you. Um, we mentioned deal breakers earlier, and also you should test drive every car. Um, this is the reason why you should test drive this, but not only this one, 
because I don't want to say, you know, the Traverse has a, a, a bad front seat. This version's seat, This trim. This trim yeah. was, was not great. I right. found the same thing you did. I don't use lumbar support. I don't like it. I find it to be intrusive. Me too. Um, so I turn it me. off. I want to turn off lumbar support at all costs in every car that I get into. And this one, you can't. It's just there right. pushing right. you. Right. Like, and so that was, this is why, you know, I couldn't sit in that seat and drive this car every day for that reason, but it's possible that another trim may have a better seat. And what about so. you, Emily? Because we're all different body types. Yeah, yeah I was gonna say, I'm like, your body, your spine has natural curvature. So sometimes being able to adjust that lumbar support to the right portion of the curvature is helpful. Oh, for sure. Um, I actually didn't mind the seat. I found it pretty comfortable for me. I, you know, I can get into a good driving position. I was able to adjust it enough as I needed to. And again, we did our little field trips. We were in it for several hours and I had no issues. Okay. So again, to your point though, yeah. that's why you really should be test driving the seat. I feel like when we do test drives, you know, it can be tempting to just be like, oh, okay, just a quick little thing. Yes. Like if they give you 20 minutes, take the full 20 minutes, right? Like you need to make sure that you're really settling into the seat and you know doing the different adjustments and stuff that you need to do so that you can see if it's sustainable for you exactly because it was this was something i noticed when i got in the car i said okay i'll give it a chance i'll see what happens you know 20 minutes down the road well 20 minutes down the road for me it still wasn't working but in other for other people maybe it you know you get used to it and it's okay right and so. what and it's kind of a bummer in a sense just because like the driving position, which is a big thing for me, uh, I thought worked pretty well. Right. You know, yes, like it is good. when you look at, um, there's there's lots of headroom. I don't have, there's no no center console intrusion with your right knee, which is always a big thing for me. Arm rests are well That's placed. Also Arm rests are well placed. Kind of Wide left out. foot rest. Uh, no problem seeing the gauges through the steering wheel, which we're seeing with more and more of these rectangular, mm -hmm. you know, wide instrument screens trying to see through a round wheel. And I'm not saying let's have rectangular steering wheels. Please but don't. But we're, we're having, you know, in, um, information cut out at the top that's not happening here and i thought the armrests were well positioned but i thought the the one on the door is super thin and it got uncomfortable for me quickly uh so so i didn't like that but um i did like that the thing that i've been noticing lately for me is because i'm a short driver and i have to move my seat so far forward um the padding on the center console tends to be behind me yes so yeah. By the time I'm able to try to rest my, I've gotten myself positioned and then I go to rest my elbow and I'm barely catching the padded portion. And that's annoying. And it's super annoying. Right. But I did find that in the Traverse that there was still like a decent oh, chunk good. of padding good. that came forward. And so it was, it was more comfortable. I could actually <laughs> rest my yeah. arms on something. Okay. So we can't do, uh, you know, first impressions on a vehicle here at Consumer Reports without talking about controls. So <laughs> let's talk about controls. Some highs and lows, Emily. What do you what did you think? What did you like and what didn't you like about the Traverse's controls? For the most part, I was okay with it. I'm okay with where like the screen is. It didn't feel too far away for me. Um, but I think I also kind of just naturally lean forward a little bit as I drive. So like maybe that just kind of helped make up the difference. The thing that annoyed me the most about the controls was that I didn't know where to find the volume buttons. On the steering wheel, ah, yeah. Um, there's three buttons for cruise control, but the st the volume buttons are behind the steering wheel, and I didn't know that <laughs> until <laughs> I almost went into the logbook to write where in the world are the volume buttons and why do they not exist? And then Joe showed me where they were, and I was like, I would never find this unless somebody showed it to me because I don't I don't naturally grip the the steering wheel in that way or feel for them behind. Um, and it's been a while. Yeah, I you guess just have to get used to it. Yeah, yeah. since I've gotten to show you to find it. I love it. having it. I know, you yeah. loved it. I read your note, <laughs> and I was like, what do you mean you love it? Why should they be back there? <laughs> so, clearly very different appearance. It's really hard to label those. I think that's the problem. Do you know what I mean? It's really hard to label There's something that's on, you know what I mean? Like, it's on the back of the yeah. Well, you can't label it, so. Exactly. Maybe that's my issue. There's nothing that tells me to look back You know what there. they need? They need arrows. So you're holding the steering wheel. And the buttons are like here. So you need an, an arrow here that's saying like, like wrap around, <laughs> like, like uh, track skip here. And it's saying it's like starting to wrap around. I don't know. I'm just help. I'm trying to help Chevy out here. Or maybe they just move it to the front. Yeah, but it just frees up room for other controls. That's why I think like that's the why they do Like three cruise control <laughs> ones. Yeah. I don't know. I can't explain everything. 
Um, <laughs> I appreciate you tried. My I biggest guess. annoyance was the uh, the uh, uh, emergency flashes button on the overhead console. I think that is that's, that's actually not annoying. It's dangerous, right? Because you should be able to access that quickly. Yeah. You know, see it easily. It should be a big button. It should be a big red button like like right here that you can just press for any time. Someone's slowing down ahead, you know, traffic's maybe coming to a stop on the highway and you need to warn people behind you quickly. You should be able to find it. It shouldn't be up here on the overhead console. Yeah. Um, people don't look there. I mean, even right. when we see it for other safety systems, if they put it on the overhead console, like that's like the last place I'm looking to find where right. where something is, especially something that you are going to be using frequently. Right. right. Luckily, most Americans don't use their emergency flashers for emergency situations. And I'm saying that, you know, facetiously, facetiously yeah. they should be, but they don't. So maybe Chevy feels like, ah, just put it up there. It's out of the way. No one's going to use them anyway, but they should be using them. If you go to Europe, that's how they drive. As soon as someone starts slowing down, you know, as soon as traffic, if it starts getting jammed up ahead, they're all throwing on their emergency flashers because yeah. that's the way they were taught how to drive because you're trying, it's, it's, you're trying to help the people behind you. You're also trying yeah. to help yourself to not get, you know, rear-ended, but you're really trying to just, yeah. it's for the Alert good of people. everyone else. Yeah. Exactly. So it should be in an easy location. I feel like Steve, you have something you want to say. Well, it's not related. I mean, I agree with pretty much everything um, you both have said about the controls. Uh, one thing that I like about it, and it's almost as if like we've been saying this at CR for a while, that like climate controls shouldn't be in the screen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, they are, right. and that's okay. But there's also a redundant knob below and buttons for the climate control. So right. I love that. And it's almost like, like instead of having just one, it is kind of nice having an option to have these um, features within the screen and also the knobs below. So... Um, yeah, it, I it, like the knob. I, it's a different knob than the volume knob, which right. is a little bit higher up. So mm -hmm. it's I agree. Um, I didn't like the driving mode button. Now, I know, you know, maybe a lot of people. The reality is probably a lot of people yeah. don't use them. OK, let's be honest. OK, but if you're going to put it in there, you should still make it logical. So it's over here on the driver's left dash. Right. So and it's kind of out of the way. You have to kind of mm -hmm. look around to find yeah. so you're pressing this button. That's you're pressing this button. that's way over here. And it doesn't. The modes don't show up in the, in the instrument cluster, screen. Yeah. It shows over here. So you now you're, you, yeah. you, the proximity between the two is, so you're trying to like press this, press this button. And also it's just, it's silly. And there's that, that L button. Ah, let's talk about the L on button. On the steering wheel. So in my yeah. grand search for the volume, right? <laughs> I basically pushed everything <laughs> on this steering wheel because I guess the volume knob was a little far for me. Cause I was like, okay, this cannot be the only place that they've put it for me to adjust the volume here by the center screen, right? And at an angle away from the driver. Um, so in my search, I did push the L because I was like, who knows, right? Like maybe this is what it's for. And then it popped up with low gear and I was like, nope, not what I wanted. <laughs> and I was like, not sure what that's for either, but not volume. So, so I'm not gonna lie to you. I, uh, you, you know, so it has, it. it has, no, well, well, it has paddle shifters. And I couldn't figure out, I'm like, why are these, why won't these work? You know, I'm trying to downshift. I like to, you know, use uh, engine braking to help slow the vehicle on, on downhills and stuff. And I'm like, they won't engage. And it took me a little while before I finally saw that button on the steering wheel, which says L. And if you hit that, that's how you can start using. But that means if you want to grab a quick downshift to help slow down, you have to first press this silly yeah, button. That's a two-step. And it's, I mean, it's just. It's silly. It's annoying, right? You shouldn't have to do that. If you want to grab a, a quick downshift or an upshift, you should be able to do that. And uh, you shouldn't have to press this tiny little button. So I think that's silly. Um, I think we all agree with that. So um, let's talk about standard active safety and driver assistance features. Uh, it comes standard with automatic emergency braking with pedestrian and cyclist detection, blind spot warning, rear cross traffic warning, reverse automatic emergency braking, lane departure warning, lane keeping assistance, adaptive cruise control, and automatic high beams. Uh, so that's great. But let's talk about some things that you deal with, uh, rear occupant alert and rear belt minder, standard, not standard, and quick take on, I guess, on what they both are. In case people don't know what a rear occupant alert is or rear belt, belt minder and why you feel they're so important. Yeah. Um, so I oversee our rear seat safety evaluation here at the track and essentially what we're looking for is, um, well, two of the things we're looking for are rear belt minders. Mm -hmm. So typically most vehicles will have a seatbelt reminder for your driver and front passenger. And we really wanna see manufacturers implement that for the rear seating positions as well. 
the stats show that belt usage in the back seat is like 10 percentage points at least lower than front seat usage. Um, but we also know that like seat belts are really important, right? They help protect you in a crash. And so we really want to encourage belt usage. So we've been advocating for manufacturers to implement rear belt minders, and we've been scoring them on it since 2021 as part of our rear seat safety evaluation. So I am pleased that the Traverse does have a rear belt minder. Yes, standard on all trims. Um, and so what we really want to see is a buckle up reminder, which is going to be something that, you know, shows up at ignition on in the dash um, to help remind passengers to buckle up. I prefer the systems to be annoying. So I do want a visual and audible system that so escalates. you're the one. I'm the one <laughs> that escalates as rear passengers don't buckle up. Right. And then we want a secondary system that's an unbuckled alert. And so if a passenger unbuckles during a trip, right, it will ding at you right. and escalate right. until they buckle up again. Most vehicles on the market have a true unbuckle alert, but that not a good buckle up reminder. And um, it tends to just be a visual only, which doesn't really incentivize anybody to put their seatbelt on unless right. you have a driver who's like, we're not moving until everyone's buckled up, right? right? Having an unbuckled alert is great and all, but if the person never buckles up, it's of no use. Right. And right. so that's why we are really pushing manufacturers to make a more rigorous buckle up reminder. So that's one system. The other, which often gets confused uh, between the two, is rear occupant alerts. And these are systems that are vehicle integrated to help prevent children being left behind in vehicles unintentionally. And essentially, the systems are two types. An end of trip reminder, which will give you, it uses door logic. So it just detects whether or not you've opened a rear door prior to or after turning on the car. And it makes the assumption that you probably put something or someone back there that you might want to remember at the end of your trip. Right. And it'll give you an audiovisual alert at the end of the trip. The second type of system goes beyond that and incorporates occupant sensing, and it will actually detect rear occupants in the vehicle. The Traverse has the standard end of trip reminder across yep. all of its trims. Rear door logic. Rear door logic, yep. exactly. GM was actually the first ones to implement this type of system in the US market um, back on their 2017 GMC Acadia. Yep. And that was awesome. And my pain point is that we're now at the 2024 model year and they've made no enhancements to their system, yeah. right? So I'm really hoping to see GM step up and continue to be an industry leader in this area to enhance the system and include occupant sensing because that's going to account for a lot more situations. Yeah, um, that's great. <laughs> Thank you, you for lot. that. And I hope people uh, enjoyed that kind of little tutorial on what those two systems are because I think a lot of people don't know what they are, especially because yeah. there's... Uh, automakers use different um, use terminology different for some of those, right? So you might think yeah. you might think the rear occupant they might almost call the rear occupant alert like a like a almost like a rear uh, rear seat reminder. Yeah, or something. so it's confusing, and then you yeah. confuse confuse rear seat reminder with rear belt minder, right? So yeah. that's easy to do. So thank we you help for that. Clear that up on our vehicle model pages. Yeah. So if you go into our ratings and specs, you can see under the rear seat safety section, it'll tell you exactly whether or not your car has an end of trip reminder, yep. if it has rear occupant sensing and a rear belt minder. Okay. For free. Uh, great. Fantastic. Um, Steve, I want to talk real quick about, we we mentioned early on about uh, GM's Super Cruise, which is was optional on this vehicle and we got it on ours. It has been a very high scoring uh, active driving assistance system, which if people don't know, that's basically, it's a system that gives the driver the ability to simultaneously use adaptive cruise control, lane centering assistance. And uh, Super Cruise has done very well in our in our uh, testing. Now we haven't tested this one yet in this vehicle, but what are your early impressions? Yeah, my, um, I loved it. Yeah. I think I, you know, I've driven Super Cruise before and in other cars that we've had, but this iteration of it is phenomenal. Like I am not even one that usually uses these active driving assists, yep. um, you know, but I thought this was so good. I'm on the highway and it is absolutely smooth. There's no ping ponging whatsoever. And the coolest feature I found is, you know, I'm cruising in the right lane at a speed and I'm coming up on a, on a car in front of me. It automatically goes around them, passes them. So it goes into the left lane, passes them. And then that's not even my favorite part. My favorite part is then it goes back yeah. into the right lane. Like, and I, I only say that because I feel like, you know, there's, 
a huge issue of like you know people just hogging up the left lane and and, and slowing down traffic. I see where you're going. I with feel this. like every yeah. single car should have this. Yes. To bring people Force back them. into the right lane after yep. they make make a pass. No more I left think, lane hogs. Oh, it's amazing. Yeah. And I li- I liked it for myself, and I yeah. think every car should okay. have this. I think it's really refined. This is it's 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 great now. But I'm curious to see what the experts will have to say about it. You know, that's just my opinion. Yep. I have a counterpoint. Uh oh. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. So <laughs> let's keep it friendly. Yeah. It is friendly. Um, I think the Super Cruise and the Traverse did a great job. Like when you're, you know, in that one lane, it handles so nicely. To your point, there's no none of that ping ponging. It's easy to activate. All of that was great. The part I didn't like about the auto lane change was that sometimes I felt like I could see in the lane adjacent to me the vehicle that's coming up behind. The car has started to signal that it's going to move over. That car is not slowing down. And the Super Cruise is very confident in its abilities. And it, it starts to, it wants to continue this lane change. And I'm like, I don't think so because I'm not confident that the driver behind me is going to allow for that without it being really close. So I actually overrode it several times to be like, no, no car. We're just going to stay where we are right now because I don't, I don't know that it was always doing a good job gauging the oncoming traffic yeah. in the adjacent lane um, and like adjusting for maybe how fast they were coming on. Right. So it, it was it didn't always make me super confident. But again, to your point, we're going to have the team that goes yes. and tests it out here on our yep. ADAS loop. And so we'll have a better, more formal sense of how it's doing. But that was my one caveat was like, I felt like I had to override it a lot. I'm like, I don't know if you see the car that's coming up. Right. I well, can totally see that. I didn't get into a situation like that. There wasn't a lot of traffic when I used it. Um, but yeah, I mean, to I your point, to it's, try it more. It's, it's a neat that. feature. Yeah. But to your point, uh, they don't always work perfectly yet. You know, yeah. uh, maybe they will someday. Maybe they won't. But uh, um, it really drives home the point, though, that even if you are using these types of systems, you still need pay to pay attention. attention. Absolutely. Yeah. And this super cruise system does make you do that. That's one of the great things about it is that you have to be, your eyes have to be looking down the road or the system will stop, you know, providing uh, its yes. assist. So that's that's a great thing. Um, okay. Before we kind of wrap things up on the Traverse, let's talk cargo because, uh, look, families, usually kids, it seems like they have a lot of stuff. They do You know, have a lot me, I just have like one backpack and I'm good. <laughs> I'm serious. And, and your collection of bikes. No, they don't always come with me. Okay. Anyway, so how, how's the Traverse do in terms of cargo? Cargo-wise, I thought it had pretty decent space, um, even if you have that third row up, right? Throughout the cabin, there's nice, like, in-cabin storage also. Um, I like the extra cubby underneath the center console up front. I can keep my handbag there. I can keep takeout things I want to hide from my children. I keep it under there because yep. um, they get into the center console <laughs> so I can hide it underneath. Um, I also really like there's like this secret like under floor compartment in the cargo area. And so when you're doing child seat installs and you have to, if you have to remove the head restraint, I find it's a great place to like stow that head restraint so that one, it stays with your car when you actually do need it. And two, yep. it's not just like flying around as a projectile. So I was pretty pleased with the amount of cargo room. And then obviously if you fold down that third row, right, you've got like tons of great flat storage, which yep. is awesome. Yeah. Huge cargo room. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I said it better than myself. I like how much cargo space is in the center console too. Yeah. Um, there's like a nice little cubby where I could put the keys, the phone, everything else. That, so it doesn't occupy my cup holder. Yep. Uh, okay. uh, small item storage is very important. Yeah. Yes. We have lots of, we're carrying lots of little things these days uh, from our phones, wallets, keys, everything. Key yeah. fob, you know, because there's no more uh, key holder anymore in the, in the steering oh, column. Yeah. Is that what it was know? called? A key yeah, holder? key holder. I mean, it's an ignition <laughs> switch, but, you know, they're gone because yeah. it's all pushed Maybe on. we'll go full circle and have like a cubby there to put your key. Yeah. In. <laughs> anyway, um, so let's say uh, you were in the market for a three-row midsize SUV. Uh, would the Traverse be on your shopping list? And if it wasn't maybe your, the one you would go with, what would you go with instead? I'm going to, Steve, I'm going to start with you. Uh, okay. I, so this isn't even hypothetical because, uh, you're doing my, it. Yeah. My wife did get a midsize SUV and, uh, it is what we would buy. I would probably get a Volvo XC90 instead of this. And I know you're going to say there's a difference in price. Yeah. It's a luxury yes, SUV. It's a luxury SUV, but the price is only a couple thousand dollars different. Not to mention if, uh, you lease it, Volvo has really good lease rates, which actually make 
the lease rates are lower than for this traverse. Yeah. So, and the, but the reason I would go with it is because there's just a nicer fit and finish. It has a, a, a nicer, more luxurious sure. feel to it. And it has all these great features um, that the Traverse also does. The third row is about is a little bit smaller, maybe. We don't really use the third row that much, um, just in a pinch. So that for that reason, I would choose that. I probably, as I mentioned, I don't like the seat in the Traverse, so I wouldn't buy it for that reason anyway, but yeah. um, that's me. Okay, that's Emily, point. what about you? Yeah. Um, I would get the Palisade. Okay. If we were buying... Hyundai Palisade. Hyundai Palisade, um, which my son affectionately called the Palace for many years. Okay. Um, <laughs> but I I like the styling of it better. I like how it handles better. Um, and I don't know. I just feel like with the Palisade, Hyundai just did such a good job of making it so handy. Like as a mom and ha like you're saying, having lots of little things, like there was just... Tons of places for me to like keep things stowed and just, it was just so useful the way like, I felt like their interior design was just so thoughtful to the fact that like, this is likely a segment that has like little people and lots of stuff for those people. And I just really appreciated that. Also, I always loved like the safety equipment that comes with that Palisade, um, all the different standard safety systems. It has um, occupant sensing as well available for that rear occupant alert. So to me, that was just a better fit for us. I think the interior quality comes across a little stronger in, in the Palisade as well than the Traverse. Yeah, and I, I like that it's not as, I don't feel like I'm driving as large of a vehicle. Yeah. In the Traverse, I feel like I'm in a yeah. big, yeah. big SUV, you really don't. Yeah. right? And the, even though they're the same class, the Palisade doesn't give that feel. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for me, it would be the Mazda CX-90. So unlike, uh, I just think, first of all, I think it's a lot more vehicle for the, for about the same money. Uh, unlike the Traverse, where I really don't like its turbo four cylinder, I love the CX-90's uh, turbo inline six. I mean, you, you pretty much, I mean, it's just- That's a great motor. It's a wonderful motor. It loves to rev, it's, it's polished. There are a few, you know, low speed hiccups in terms of just a little bit turbo lag, leaving the line, and then the first uh, like one, two, two, three shifts are a little bit bumpy. But after that, it's just a wonderful driving uh, machine, really smooth shifts uh, the majority of the time. Um, I think it's it's got sharp steering, sharp handling, you know, definitely far better. Okay, definitely, I won't say far better. A fair amount better than the Traverse. You know, you're going to enjoy taking this thing through corners. Uh, and I also kind of, you were talking about styling. I think it looks fantastic. It's got this like kind of hunkered down like stance to it that g gives it a sporty feel. And I really, I really like that. Um, it's like a little mini love letter about the I, Yeah, but not that everything's perfect. It's got that goofy, the, some of the controls are odd. It's got that goofy upside down L-shaped gear selector, which we all hate. So, I yeah. mean, it's not, it's not, no vehicle is perfect and it's not. But anyway. Um, yeah, so we have a first drive on this 2024, uh, Chevrolet Traverse. We, uh, so check that out at consumerreports.org. We will be sending it through our full road test program. Mm -hmm. So, uh, stay tuned for, uh, our results on that as soon as we, we get it through everything and, and that's written up. Um, and with that, let's move on to audience questions. And the best way to reach us to send us those questions is cr.org slash talking cars. And we started a new thing where if we choose your question, uh, we will send you out some CR swag. So, you know, maybe a t-shirt, hat, I don't know, whatever they have lying around. But I bet it's pretty nice. It is pretty nice. Yeah. Maybe I'll send in a question. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, so do we still do video questions, Dave? We can send those in too? So, so the, our producer says we can still do video questions as well. So we really like those 30 second clips when you do like put a little effort into it, like a nice background, you know, maybe your car. Well, I'm serious. We've gotten some really nice videos where people are really trying hard and that's going to get you the swag. Exactly. That Monty wants also. Yeah. Yeah. Th I'm going to, I'm going to make one of these videos. All right. Trust me. All right. So our first question comes from James from Tampa, Florida. James says during hurricane Helene, there were reports of Tesla's catching fire due to flooding in the Tampa area. The local fire chief warned people not to drive any electric vehicle, uh, that had been flooded until you can get it inspected. Is this a Tesla only problem? Are all EVs susceptible to this? Are hybrid cars with lithium ion batteries subject to this problem? Uh, so Steve, I'm gonna throw this to you. 
Uh, what did you find out about this? Yeah, I talked to um, Big John and our amazing auto tech team about this, and, and I asked, what do they think about flooded cars like this? Well, I found out it's not a Tesla-only problem. It's actually the potential for flooding the battery packs is there for all high-voltage batteries. That includes hybrids, plug-in hybrids, and EVs. And really the issue is when there's water intrusion into the battery case. And the the biggest issue about this is when there's salt water. Salt is like uh, it's corrosive. corrosive and it really conducts electricity. And, and that's when it starts to cause problems and um, light things on fire. Uh, so to answer um, the question here is yes, you should always get it checked by a mechanic. Um, in gen and that's in general, that's for yep. all cars. I mean, yeah. cars don't like water. So right. even <laughs> if you have a internal combustion engine, there could be a lot of other issues with wiring harnesses and uh, electronics in the car that are no good. You really want someone professional to, to take the car apart and see that, that everything is dry or be able to dry everything out. And even then they're telling me, uh, the you know, our, our auto tech team said, there's still a chance that you won't dry everything out and there right. could still be problems down the line. So this is a huge issue. And yes, for um, battery packs, it is a fire risk. Right. And we have a lot of other stories on consumerreports.org about, you know, flood related with, with vehicles, whether it's, you know, how to avoid buying a, a flood damaged car yep. or the dangers of driving on flooded streets. We have a lot of stories up on consumerreports.org about that. So please check that out. Um, okay. Next question comes from Michael from South Carolina. Michael says, I am picking up a new 2025 Honda Civic Hybrid soon, and I was wondering, is there a specific way that is recommended to break in a hybrid engine? Traditionally, I've heard that you need to not push a standard internal combustion engine for a few thousand miles, uh, but I didn't know if that applied to hybrids as well. I, I mean, that's a great, that's a great question. And uh, luckily, the answer is kind of simple, which is that, you know, you're going to treat them the same way as you treat internal combustion engine car. And, uh, but the number one thing is always look at your owner's manual, your vehicle owner's manual. That's the number one place to go. I will say they're not quite as easy to find as they used to be. It used to make it a lot more obvious in the, in the, you know, uh, contents or whatever of, mm. of where to find that. But if you look hard enough, you should be able to find it. Uh, although not all vehicles, uh, manufacturers do that anymore. Volvo, for instance, doesn't even have a, they don't even list a break-in procedure anymore. And also that's partly because modern engines and Steve, I think you can speak to this as one of our, um, uh, data analyst people is that they're just simply more robust than they used to be. So there isn't quite as much, uh, of a detailed break in procedure as there used to be, but big John, our chief mechanic here says that, uh, you know, there are still things you should follow just, you know, as a general rule, uh, don't push the engine too hard for the first 500 to thousand miles. Uh, don't maintain a constant speed, uh, engine speed for too long. Uh, try to vary it during that initial driving. Uh, and just for fun, I went out and looked at a couple of hybrids, uh, actually one hybrid in our fleet and a plug-in hybrid. And the Kia Carnival hybrid uh, says for the first 600 miles, don't race the engine, which means basically don't push it hard, okay? And avoid hard stops to allow the brakes to seat properly. Mm -hmm. So that's that's pretty easy stuff. You should be able to do that. And you should you should do that with any new vehicle, really. Uh, the Lexus NX 450H plus uh, PHEV, so it's a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle, a little more specific. For the first 200 miles, avoid sudden stops. Again, that's for the brakes, okay? Uh, for the first 1,000 miles, do not drive at extremely high speeds. Uh, I mean, that's kind of a little obvious, but you're probably getting a ticket if you're doing that. But anyway, <laughs> avoid sudden acceleration. That's one of the really important ones, right? Do not drive continuously uh, in low gears and do not drive again at a constant speed for extended periods. So, you know, you're just trying to vary your engine speed as much as you can without being hard on it. And for the first 500 miles, don't tow a trailer. So that's uh, it's a lot of advice. Remember, always check the owner's manual first. Yes. That's your go-to. That's a good question though, for the, for the plug-in hybrid. What if you keep plugging that in and keep driving in 30 minute spurts of, of electric power or 30 miles at a time and, and it's all electric and you know, how do you keep track of when you're breaking in the internal combustion motor part of it? Yeah, it's a really good question. We'll say we'll have to research that one next. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, the engine's going to come on anyway yeah. at times, yeah. so it will come on. But uh, but the yeah, I guess the main thing is just don't push it hard for those early, in that case, probably it could be a, th a 
couple thousand miles, you know, but you do yeah. want to, but, but again, luckily they are built pretty robust. So you don't have to worry about it as much as you used to. All right. Um, I think that's going to do it for this episode. If you want to learn more about uh, cars and the topics that we talked about, you can click on the links in the show notes. And if you have a question, don't forget to visit cr.org slash talking cars. Thanks so much for watching and we'll see y'all next time.